you can't invent anything unless somebody comes along and says, I do wish they'd invent something that would do this. And then ideas flood into your mind. But until that, that key is turned in the lock, nothing seems to happen. It's very interesting. I've noticed this over and over again. It's the need that drives the invention. My parents gave me for Christmas one year a box containing all sorts of odds and ends, bits of electrical gear, mag uh, magnets, compasses, um, no nothing complicated, a bell, a light, uh, whatnot. He said, there you are, go and play with that. I found it fascinating. It's by far the best Christmas present. And I remember bothering my relatives and people, even the postman, by asking, why do you need two wires to send electricity along? Uh, when gas or water you can send just down a pipe. And of course, nobody could answer it. <laughs> I realised then that I'd have to go and find out for myself. <laughs> now, in the lead-up to the invention of the electron capture detector, um, I had in mind a constant reiteration by my boss during the war, uh, a delightful man called Robert Bedillon. Uh, we worked on all sorts of subjects, but he was interested in the transfer of disease by airborne particles and so on. And he said, you know, he said, we just got no instrument at all to detect a draft to measure a, a very low air movement. Uh, we, we can measure a breeze, but any the, the outside, but anything low, like the movements of air in the room, there's nothing you can measure it with at all. So, I mean, this was like red rags were bull to me. Ah, oh, that's an invention. He wants, wants to measure it. How could you do it? And that was you could measure it by ionizing the air. In, in, in a spherical space. And uh, if you ionise it with a radioactive source put somewhere in, in, in the thing, the ions move in air, not at all, unless there's a wind blowing, but you can measure exceedingly slow speeds. And you can measure air movements as low as a foot a minute with this ionisation anemometer. But that, that, so I had all of this in my mind. And then I moved on to the free frozen hamster thing. And it turned out that the resistance of animals to freezing depended a lot on how unsaturated or saturated their fats were. And I got samples of the have hamster fat and wanted to get them analysed. Now, Archer Martin had just got his Nobel Prize for inventing gas chromatography. And he had a lab just above mine. So I went up the stairs to Archer's lab and said, look, do you think you could tell me what the fatty acids are in this sample? And he looked, he said, oh, I'd love to do it. And he said, but, but how much is here? And I said, oh, there's about, you know, 10 micrograms or something. He said, oh, no good. He said, you'll have to go away uh, um, and bring back milligrams. Uh, 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 our instrument is can do wonderful separations, but, but it's just not sensitive enough, the detector, uh, to um, detect quantities that small. And then he looked at me and said, of course you could invent a better detector for me. <laughs> that start turned the switch, and I thought of this anemometer and all these things and movement of ions, and said, oh yes, I'll have a go at that. And in two weeks, I came back with the first detector, which was a thing called an argon detector. Uh, in the course of trying to improve and lessen the amount of radioactivity needed in the argon detector, uh, I happened to find an anomaly where you've got negative signals. And this was the origin of the ECD. It was particularly sensitive to halogen-substituted uh, uh, compounds, 
uh, like uh, carbon tetrachloride, which is quite poisonous, um, DDT, PCBs, all of those kind of things that uh, worry the environmentalists. And uh, so it became a very valued detection device for all sorts of branches of the environmental movement. It seemed to pick up the things that were poisonous and ignore the things that were, were harmless. In April uh, 1965, I think it was, yes, when lying on my desk was a letter, and to my amazement, it was from the director of space flight operations of NASA, which was at that time only three years old and had hardly done anything at all. Um, and he wrote asking, would I like to be a, a, an experimenter on the surveyor mission to the moon to look at the uh, um, soil and other things on the moon to see if they were suitable for astronauts to land there? And uh, I think that it was probably one of the first contacts by the American space program with a British scientist. And the reason he wrote to me was not because I was a well-known scientist or anything like that. No way. It was because of the ECD and a few other devices I made, which were tiny little things uh, that would easily fit on the primitive, simple rockets like Pioneer uh, that NASA was, had first made. And it, more than that, it used very little power to produce its measurements uh, so that that would be no drain on batteries or something like that. Uh, and it gave a clear, precise signal that could be sent from uh, Mars to Britain. So it was it was just what they needed for their program. It wasn't because I was a notable scientist or anything like that. It so happened that in the village where I lived and that my lab was in those days, which was Bower Chalk, which is about 12 miles southwest of Salisbury in southern England. There lived also, very close to me, almost a neighbour, William Golding, the uh, Lord of the Flies and uh, other famous books. He was very interested in this question of life on Mars uh, and uh, we would talk together. And I told him about my idea. I thought the Earth was populated with organisms which regulated the composition of the atmosphere and ocean and soil and so on, and, and kept it stable and had been doing ever since life began uh, two, two or three billion years ago. And he said, look, Jim, if you're going to have a big ideas like that, you'd better give it a proper name. And so I said, well, what would you call it? He said, well, I call it the Gaia theory. And uh, I thought... We went on talking of total cross purposes because he, I thought he'd said Gaia, G Y R E, the great world. I mean, after all, I was talking about a circular process. And after we'd settled that, he said, no, 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 I meant the Greek goddess. Looking ahead into the coming century, that might affect the Earth's climate or the conditions on, on our planet. And my answer is fairly simple. I was delighted to read in the newspaper, I've forgotten which one it was, a little while ago, that the head of NASA had, had announced just a short while ago that the, mo the most urgent thing he was recommending the president to do was to start a program to build a rocket that would be capable of deflecting an asteroid that might be on course uh, for the Earth. And I do agree wholeheartedly with him. We have ample evidence that asteroids can repeatedly hit planets in the solar system, and they do catastrophic damage when they do. I'm a cheerful person, and I don't like the idea we're going to be wiped out. Of. It seems such a waste. <laughs> all this time so doing all these things and all for nothing um, no I, 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 th I think we've got a chance 
and uh, the, the way we've got a chance is already been shown by those very bright uh, computer people who made things like AlphaGo uh, uh, and so on. And th this, I think, opens a doorway for evolution of new species of organisms, which are mainly, entirely, running on information rather than uh, uh, you know, the ordinary physical constants that, that we run on. And uh, we, we may, I doubt whether we'll see it because we won't be survived that long, but the future uh, will be a planet with, with, with a fair number of uh, these, call them what you like, I don't know, cyborgs are a fairly good name, but uh, they're, they're essentially creatures that uh, are based on AI um, and uh, less and less dependent on chemistry and physics for that.